Last chapter, interaction. Um, let's just start by taking a look at a very classic uh, data viz example. And this is Murray's Paris to Lyon train schedule. And this comes from 1885. It's one of the sort of masterpieces of visualization. And what I'd like to do is show you how something even as marvelous as this can be improved with something called interaction. So in this particular diagram, the x-axis represents time, and the y-axis represents the nominal location, the very top, Paris, bottom, Lyon. And what you can see is each train is represented by a, different, a line of a different slope. So lines that are sloping to the right are trains that go from Paris to Lyon, and trains that are sloping up and to the right are trains going from Lyon to Paris. So something as wonderful as this can be improved with some very simple interaction. So what we've done here is uh, this is a code written by Mike Bostock in a very uh, excellent uh, online graphing library called D3. And he's added some interactive widgets across the top. And this allows us to do things like, well, let's just turn off the southbound trains. And I'm only interested in not the everyday, but just Saturdays. And I'm only interested in the bullet trains. Oh, look, there's actually none on Saturday. So I wonder, I'll have to look at weekdays. Ah, looks like there's plenty during weekdays. So your ability to actually change what data are being represented from the entirety of the data set gives us an incredible power to see patterns that are ones that aren't necessarily visible in the encoding of the data set in its entirety. Let's look at some other examples and see how our ability to interact with data also give us an incredible power to learn things about patterns. So here is something called the zip decoder. It's made by Ben Fry. It's a wonderfully simple data visualization where what Ben has done is he's mapped every uh, unique postal code to a dot in latitude and longitude. And what you can do is by clicking on the map and you enter, everybody just enters their own zip code and they're able to see the, how the zip codes form a shape. And so for example, I come from Long Island, New York, so I would type one, and you can see here that this is the Northeast. One, that's Long Island. And then seven, four, seven. And you can see we've slowly, gradually reduced the amount of noise. But of course, you can enter whatever you want. And you can see here quickly that if you just type nine, that this is the West Coast. And that eight is uh, slightly more inward. Seven is Texas in the South. Six, five, four. So you can see there are different patterns that in the entirety aren't visible. But by your ability to interact, what we've really done here is something called dynamic filtering. And what we're doing is we're maintaining the representation, but we are removing or highlighting data depending on commands that we give the computer. And so here, when I'm saying to show me just these, what it's really doing is making more salient the data that I'm interested in looking at. Um, another example of this type of filtering, here is uh, the different types of travel, uh, 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 you know, airline travel between, um, uh, where is it exactly? <laughs> um, between somewhere and somewhere else. But the main point is that what you can see here is at the top is a, uh, a one chart, a histogram, showing arrivals by time of day and this range of date. And what we can do here is if we increase the date, what you can see is we add, and you'll see the time of day, that histogram is getting, the, the shape of the histogram is changing based on the actual data. And we're 
changing the entirety of the data that's being included. And then what we can do is using the cursor, select just a subsample of these below. So now what I'm doing is looking at data between January and February, and just at, uh, you know, between six and 10 in the morning. And I now can look at different flights here. So if I'm interested in saying, oh, well, what about flights that are, you know, in uh, February and that uh, are in the afternoon, we can see here that this is the list of flights below. And up top, we can see the uptime, the arrival delay. So for example, if I want to pick of these flights, the ones that are the most on time, I could subselect again. So this ability to filter, right, the underlying representation main is the same, and the visual presentation is the same. All we're adding is this layer that's saying, show me some of the data, but not all of the data. And because you're showing the data that maps to the question that you're asking, you're actually able to understand a great deal about the data. Another wonderful example of this kind of dynamic filtering uh, is a data visualization called Five Years of Info Aesthetics, which takes the Info Aesthetic uh, Visualization blog and every single one of the uh, features from that uh, blog. And so, for example, I can, and you can see it organizes them by category, and if I click on one, it will show me what categories that particular visualization belong to, and it will actually get an image that represents it and show me the ability to go there. And now if I was interested in subsampling, I could actually say, well, how about the, this particular visualization? Ah, well, this one is an aesthetic or an infographic. Oh, well, I see how this works. What if I'm only interested in seeing ones with art? And so what happens is the art becomes the top level representation and all of the, the headlines that don't include art become diminished. So now I'm actually able to sample through time the different uh, visualization, uh, the different features that include uh, art as their top level uh, component. So what you can see here is this is a fascinating way to, uh, by using this idea of dynamic filtering, and changing what's being presented, you're able to give the individual this capability to see into the data. So visualization, excuse me, interaction can be a hard thing to fathom. So I look to Ben Schneiderman's example of what is it that we should do in order to make interaction with visualization as simple as possible. And he has three wonderful guidelines. Overview first, zoom and filter, details on demand. So let's go back to look at this. When we start with the overview, what we're able to do is see the entirety. Wow, there are probably 500 of these. Uh, you can see the number and the distribution over, over subjects on the right. Uh, overview is what you get when you first come. Uh, zoom and filter. So I'm, ability, I'm able to filter and I'm able to zoom by seeing, well actually I'm not able to zoom in this one, but, and then details on demand. So when I'm interested in finding out more, I could enter very specifically, I want to see this one. And then it gives you some of the, um, a, a much more detailed layer. So you see by layering the visualization and allowing people to stand back and see the big picture or to zoom in and see the individual data points, you're taking advantage of one of the things that interaction can do that other types of visualization simply can't. Um, looking at, so last, uh, something that I think is just a joy, I recommend everybody do it, it's kind of fun. It's something that was come up by uh, Martin Wattenberg, uh, and it's basically called the baby name generator. What it really is, is a statistical evaluation of names mentioned in the United States Census from the 1880s to today. 
and it shows the top 2,000 most popular names. And what you can do is track the historical popularity of different names. So I'll write here, for example, if I want to look at Scott, uh, I would type in S. It'll filter down all different names that start with S. And what you can see here is Scott actually wasn't very popular in the United States until the 1930s, achieved peak popularity in the 50s and 60s, and then is now actually not a very common name at all. Um, and then if you look at something like L, you can see names like Larry, more classic uh, American names, or a name like Linda, which had a burst in popularity between the 30s and the 60s, and is now represents a much smaller uh, popula percentage of the population. Um, find interactive data visualizations. I think what you'll find is that interaction is one of the hardest parts of data visualization to master. But it's also one of the richest, because it's the part that allows you to dive into a visualization and extract answers that are potentially harder to gather when looking at your data from a single perspective is challenging because of its density, or perhaps you're not even sure what you're looking for right yet. So I recommend uh, a tremendous, well, actually one other thing. There's, uh, I'll just put this uh, teaser at the end. Um, last year, uh, myself and a number of colleagues gave a number of keynote lectures uh, on the subject of what is data visualization. I think you'll find that uh, there's a, a really wonderful cross-section of thoughts about what visualization is. Um, if you look at the handouts for the lectures, each of the links will be in there, so you'll be able to uh, click them and explore. Uh, each of the talks is about an hour, um, so enjoy them. I hope this was interesting, and uh, you know, think visually. Thanks very much.